Welcome to the Online Bodyguard Podcast with host Philip Rendell, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Online Bodyguard. My name is Philip Grindel, as you know, and I have, today have the huge pleasure of speaking with Frederick Calhoun. So for those of you who that know me and those of you that have seen me present or have heard me or read anything on LinkedIn, you'll know that one of the things I talk about is this concept of hunters and howlers. Well, Frederick is one of the co-authors of, of, of that piece of research. And so today, is, this is a huge privilege for me because there is so much in his research that I think underpins a lot of what I believe in and what I try and do. And I think so much of what he and his, his colleagues have, have, have done and researched um, really advances the subject of, of how to assess threats. So, Frederick, thank you so much for being a guest. It's a huge privilege to have you on. Um, for those of you, for those people who are not familiar with you, how would you describe what you do and what your work involves? Well, I've, my background is a bit eclectic. Um, I have a PhD in American history from the University of Chicago. And I was hired by the United States Marshal Service to write the first history of the marshals in time for their bicentennial in 1989, which I did. And 1989 came around and I woke up and thought, wow, did I just write myself out of a job? Coincidentally, um, Walter Moody sent a mail bomb to Judge Robert Vance, um, who was a, on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit in um, Alabama, and the, the bomb killed the judge. Uh, the result of that is the Marshal Service had to put protective details around 30-some-odd judges that were associated with the 11th Circuit. Um, and I realized that nobody had ever really looked at the threats to the judiciary in the United States. Um, and so as a researcher and writer, as, as an historian, I started doing that research uh, to try and get a, a, a grip on why this occurred. Uh, one federal judge had been killed prior to 1970, from 1970 on, uh, three federal judges were killed, up to 89. And so I was wondering why, I was, why this difference between the two centuries. During the course of the research, I came across a file cabinet at the Marshal Service warehouse that had 3,000 files on individual incidents where a federal judicial official, a judge or a U.S. attorney or assistant U.S. attorney or clerk, had been threatened or um, even attacked. And I was able to transfer all that information into a database that I intended to use for my own purposes as writing my book. But I realized once I had the database complete that I knew the outcome of each of these 3,000 plus incidents. And so I could assign um, kind of put them in categories. And so I came up with uh, specious as one, which was empty. Um, the U.S. attorney might receive a death threat and then nothing else happens. Um, and the attorney is still alive. Uh, so those were empty threats. Uh, I then counted some as enhanced, where there was a report of some inappropriate communication and then something suspicious happened uh, in, in close in time to that, that did not result in violence. And then there were violent outcomes um, in the database, which did not include the first, um, in modern times, the first judge killed because uh, the incidents didn't go back that far. There were two judges killed. Uh, so those were violent outcomes. And I realized that as useful as that was for my own research, it could also be used operationally. So that the Marshal Service, on receiving a new report, could go into the database and say, well, it was, it's a written communication from a prisoner. 
uh, to a federal judge who presided over his trial? What was the outcome? How many cases have we seen like that? It might be 500 or 600. And what was the outcome of those 600? When that type of situation, 99% of the time, it was specious. And in the 1% of the time, uh, something happened that was suspicious, but fell short of violence. And so from an operational point of view, the marshal service could kind of rank new threats, the level of security that might be needed. Um, do we need to put a full-fledged body, 24-hour protection around the protectee? Uh, well, no, not in that not in that instance. It also helped in going to the target of the communication and say, look, you know, we're concerned about this because we take all these things seriously, uh, but our experience indicates that nothing serious is going to happen. These are the security measures that we're going to follow uh, because we're going to respond to this, but we're, we don't feel at this point that, that we need to do more than this. And so it, it helped reassure the target. Uh, so there are a lot of pluses to it. So uh, we implemented that in the Marshall Service at, at the time that I was there, this was going back to the 1990s. I continued writing the book, um, which is titled Hunters and Howlers, uh, threats and assaults to federal judicial officials in the United States. Um, and the reason I came up with hunters and howlers is because we had a case um, in Topeka, Kansas, where um, a man in his early 40s had been uh, arrested for growing 100 or so marijuana plants in on his farm. And with with that amount, they were able to get him for um, dealing in marijuana, although all the evidence showed that he used it for personal use. He wasn't a big seller. He also had guns in the house because he was a hunter. He and his father-in-law liked to go out and hunt whatever birds they hunt in Kansas um, as a hobby. And... His name was McKnight, Jack Gary McKnight. And McKnight was enraged at this system. The whole system came down on him, and he was looking at a 10-year uh, prison sentence, which in the United States at that time, federal prisoners were not uh, paroled. So he was going to do the whole 10 years. In his mind, um, no male in his family had lived past the age of 50-something, and so this 10-year sentence was a death sentence in, in his mind. And he really felt that the federal government had, had declared war on him. Uh, and so he went on the day of his sentencing, he went to court early in the morning um, and shot his way into the courthouse. Um, it's not clear if he had a specific target in mind or just the court in general. He killed a, a court security officer, which is a contract officer for the marshal service that runs the magnetometers and x-ray machines. They're usually retired policemen. Um, so they had, he, he killed one officer and through a ricochet, he wounded a civilian who was at the clerk's office. And then after about uh, 30 minutes or so, McKnight killed himself. Uh, and so he became the kind of inspiration, uh, or what a hunter is. Uh, in my mind, a hunter is somebody who feels uh, so unjustly treated that they're strongly motivated to fight back. Um, McKnight made a videotape the night before, and one of the things he says is, there's only one rule in a gunfight, that's bring a gun, I'm bringing mine. I hope they bring theirs, uh, very macho kind of uh, Clint Eastwood uh, personality type. And so McKnight became a hunter in my, in the model for the hunter in my mind. And at the same time in the database, I kept coming across a guy uh, named Ray who sent out dozens of letters a year to federal judges mainly all over the country. 
And he was very prominent in the database. He, he literally got, he was like a percent or two of these 3,000 cases. And the letters would be eight or 10 pages long. They would go into just in gory detail about he was going to cut the judge's head off and stick his arm down the neck hole, or he was going to rape the judge's wife and children and all these really horrible things that when a, a judge received these things, it, it really panicked them because uh, Ray was so specific and it was sent to the, the judge's office address at the courthouse. And it was very scary. And we got a couple of deputies um, we knew Ray was in prison, federal prison, uh, not only in prison, but he was in the mental health um, hospital in the prison. And so we sent a deputy to interview him and he wouldn't talk. So the deputy talked to the Ray's doctor and the doctor went to Ray and said, well, Ray, why are you writing these letters? Um, you know, you're not going to hurt them. Uh, why are you writing them? And Ray looked at his doctor and said, well, doctor, if I didn't have my letters to write, what would I do all day? And so write, writing threatening letters to Ray was a hobby. And so he, I called him a howler because I like alliteration. Um, and so I had hunters and howlers. Howlers make a lot of noise. Uh, they, they're very scary. Uh, their intention is to, is to draw attention to themselves. Uh, they, they want to frighten people but they really don't intend to do these terrible things that um, that they write about in their communications. And so howlers are not violent, but they still pose a problem and they still have to be managed. Um, if only because you don't want a howler to feel ignored and then suddenly become a hunter. Uh, and so although there's a clear distinction between uh, hunters on the one hand and howlers on the other, they're really on a kind of continuum uh, that as a threat manager, you need to pay close attention to to make sure that the howler doesn't start drifting over um, toward the precipice of becoming a hunter. Uh, and by the same token, uh, although hunters tend not to threaten or bring it, bring attention to themselves, um, <coughs> they do engage in what um, FBI researchers styled leakage uh, so that they can come to attention. Um, so having done that, I was appointed as the threat management advisor to the director of the Marshall Service. Uh, I got involved with the National Sheriff's Association through the Marshall Service with uh, running a three, four day seminar on threat management issues that uh, I recruited instructors from the Secret Service, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, sheriffs, deputy marshals, um, Secret Service. And so we went all over the, around the country uh, training uh, deputy sheriffs and local law enforcement in what was then a fairly new field of threat management. Uh, from there, that got me into consulting and um, I partnered up with Steve Weston, who at the time was in charge of the California Highway Patrol's threat management unit. And we started uh, writing together and we've now written four or five books together, all on threat management. Uh, so it's, I've been in, working in threat management for 30 years now. So. Wow. So I, I think I must have all of those books. <laughs> so so what must be what must be fascinating then you know you've been doing this 30 years and so what you must have seen then is the the emergence of obviously social media and therefore the volume of targeted threats targeted abuse targeted intimidation at public figures via that channel yes there certainly has been a change a, a, a revolution and it creates all sorts of problems, but I've always looked at it as what I call method of delivery, which is how a threat or an inappropriate communication or um, 
the thinking about committing violence, how is that communicated? So you can have written threats, you can have verbal, you can have over the telephone and now over the internet. And you can also then have suspicious activities. Um, that is something that the target notices is happening around him or her that causes them concern. Um, it could be stalking, um, target research. So of, of those writing and telephoning are keeping a distance between the subject who's making the communication and the target. And it's at the choice of the subject. The, the subject generally, with the, with the exception of informant threats, where, where somebody else is telling on the person, written telephone communications and internet communications are the choice of the subject. And what that choice seems to imply is that at this time, the subject is keeping some distance between him or her and the target. Where I get concerned is when the subject approaches the target or, or, or attempts to approach the target and either verbally communicates some inappropriate message or conducts um, stalking research behaviors, gathering information about the target. Um, those are all indicators of a, of a far more serious nature than I think um, written communications and that type of thing. Where you see a crossover now, uh, with, because of the internet, are these people who film themselves in the process of preparing and then launching their attack. Uh, and so even though the internet is some puts a distance between target and subject, and when the subject has a camera and takes the internet with him, uh, then you get a, a serious problem. Uh, and, and that needs to be paid attention to. So what, what, if I understand what you're saying, then what we're looking at is <clears throat> The behavior is more indicative than a form of communication from a distance. Yes, at a general level. And, and talking about behavior, um, one of the things that Weston and I um, first wrote about and, and expanded on and have used um, in all of our training is what we call the path to intended violence. Uh, and that involves behavior uh, that any individual who intends to uh, commit an act of violence goes through these steps um, that culminate in the attack. Uh, so first the individual like McKnight has to have a grievance. McKnight's grievance was he felt that the government had declared war on him and he was going to fight back. Uh, he was not going to uh, go easily to prison for the rest of his life. And he was going to take preparation. He was going to do things to fight back. So, so you have to have a, a, a grievance. Uh, but we all have grievances. When we get cut off in traffic, we have a grievance. We just don't, one hopes, act on it, um, and and we get over it. Uh, so having a grie grievance alone isn't enough to warrant action. But what happens with hunters is they take their grievance and start thinking that, well, the only solution to this problem is violence. I, I had. I, I can only resolve my this injustice that has been dealt me um, through violence. And once they get the idea that violence is their only remedy, now they've crossed the line, um, and they're going to start thinking seriously about how to commit the, the violence. And so you have grievance and then ideation. From there, uh, the the hunter goes to research and planning. Uh, now the research can be quite detailed, or it could be quite minimal because the subject already knows a lot about the target. So you, 
For example, in um, domestic violence, you don't see a lot of research behavior because the subject already knows where the spouse works, what the, their routines are from, during the day, where they're, they're most exposed and uh, that type of thing. So you don't see a lot of research there because it's, the subject already knows. But in public figure and uh, violence and where the subject doesn't know as much personally about the target, you see stalking behavior. Um, you see them engaged in what, exploring how to um, best get to the target. Um, this is another time when the, the internet uh, complicates things because it's so much now one can research from the safety of one's own computer and they don't have to do what they had to do 20 or 30 years ago, which is actually go visit, uh, physically inspect the sites. They can do that all over Google Maps now. So, uh, But they do have to engage in, in uh, research and from the research, they develop a plan of what they're going to do. And um, the planning, research and planning then leads to preparations. So they have to gather whatever material they need to carry out their plan. Um, that's when you start seeing um, visits to the shooting gallery to practice firing their weapon. Um, they may go out and buy a weapon specific for the occasion. They may assemble a bomb. Um, those kind of attack-related behaviors. If they don't expect to survive the attack, they'll engage in what we call final act behaviors. Um, they may prepare a will, uh, start giving them their personal possessions to family members, um, talk ominously about not having a future. With McKnight, for example, I asked his probation officer, um, he had to go through a pretrial uh, probation examination. And I, I said, was there anything unusual in your mind about McKnight? And he said, yeah, he never asked about the future. He never asked, how do I get to the prison? Am I allowed to take a toothbrush? Can I bring a change of clothing? He, he never asked the, the kind of normal questions that a an individual about to go to jail asks. Uh, and that struck the probation officer as unusual. And the reason McKnight didn't ask was because he had no intention of going to jail. He, he didn't expect to survive the attack. Um, and he was going to um, go out in a blaze of glory. So there was no need for him to know if he could bring a toothbrush or not, and that, that type of thing. Um, so the, that's the kind of final act uh, behavior that, that really should raise alarm bells. Then from preparation, they have to then um, breach the target's uh, security, however sophisticated or primitive that might be. Uh, but they have to get themselves or their bomb uh, or their attack to the target. Uh, the reason breach is important is uh, for several reasons, actually. Um, it's the last chance that the target has to, or the target security has to respond. Uh, Gavin De Becker wrote a book called Just Two Seconds, um, which he and his co authors. Uh, postulate that uh, bodyguards have a chance of successfully responding to a, an attack in the two seconds that one has from the time the attackers seem to be attacking and uh, culminating with the target. Uh, so breach is that last two seconds when security can respond. It's all breach is also important because We've seen quite a number of cases where the subject gets close to the target and changes his mind or her mind um, for whatever reason. When they chicken out, uh, they just don't, maybe they don't have the stamina for it. Um, maybe something goes wrong, uh, but they back away. And so the, we want we want to look at breach just to make sure that we can't, that somebody can stop the attack or maybe that the attacker will uh, retreat. And then, of course, the last step is the actual attack. 
when you've gotten to the attack, then the need for threat management is no longer necessary. So uh, what threat management tries to do is divert the subject off the path to intended violence before they get to attack. So um, if we start at the beginning and, and just kind of unpick a little bit about that, because when we when we look at grievance as an example, which which is um, a subject we've talked about on this on this podcast a few times, one of the um, one of the elements of research is that some people who've targeted celebrities or prominent figures, and I think um, you know Chapman who killed uh, Lennon or, and and, uh, and others, there's a this desire or there's this thought around. Um, this infamy, this, 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 they want to be connected with this person forever. So whenever you now Google John Lennon, his killer comes up with him. How does that fit into the notion of grievance? Their grievance, Hinckley's grievance, was that he was not famous like John Lennon was. Right. And the shortcut for him to get famous was to steal John Lennon's fame. Um, John Hinckley's grievance uh, for shooting President Reagan was that he wanted to come to the attention of Jodie Foster. Uh, And so that prompted him. Um, It's it's those are fame seekers. And what their grievance is, is that they're not famous. Uh, there are other types of grievances. Um, an individual gets terminated from his employment. Uh, his grievance is uh, that it was unfair. I remember a case um, going back many years. This individual was performing poorly at work. Uh, he knew that he was not performing well at work. And the company fired him. And he accepted the termination because he knew he wasn't doing his job. What offended him was the company wrote him a letter. He had worked for the company for many years, and instead of calling him down and sitting him, calling him in, sitting him down and saying, Your performance has fallen off, you're not carrying your weight, we're gonna have to let you go. They sent him a letter. And it was so impersonal. Um and he talked about how he couldn't sleep for days, that every time he closed his eyes, he would see this letter uh, that the company had sent him. And it was just so unjust a way to fire him. So it was his grievance wasn't that he got terminated. His, his grievance was how they terminated him. And he went in and, um, if I remember correctly, he killed his supervisor and wounded somebody else. Um, and I can't remember if he killed himself, but it was all based on the fact of how he got terminated, um, not that he was terminated. So grievances are can be, and frequently are, very unique and personal to the subject. It may there is no kind of rational man standard in trying to figure out why individuals set foot on the path to violence. The, um, oftentimes it, it would be incomprehensible to any uh, reasonable person. Uh, and you, and you kind of scratch your head and say, well, why in the world did he go to this extreme to do that? That doesn't matter. What matters is the issue, the grievance is, is so compelling to that person uh, that it, it, it doesn't matter if we understand it or not. What matters is, is the subject feels that way and begins to act in a way that um, culminates in a a violent attack. I I, I interviewed um, Reed Malloy not not too long ago on here, and in fact it was Reed that gave me your details. And on on our podcast we talked about grievance, and he he broke it down, and maybe this is simplifying things, but he broke it down to what he called these four elements, which he called blame, loss, anger, and humiliation. Um which I, I guess are kind of broad, I suppose, signposts, if nothing else, for, for a larger subject. Um, and, I, you know, we, we look at the, the, the employee scenario of the individual being escorted out with his cardboard box, effectively feeling humiliated 
in front of all of his work colleagues. Um, now he might also be angry about it, but he's humiliated. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I wonder what your thoughts were because I, th- I, I quite, you know, I thought that was quite a. It may be a simpli- simplification, but I thought it was actually quite a clever way of of encapsulating what a grievance is. Yeah, the Becker always, I don't know if he still does, but he used to recommend that if you're going to fire somebody, do it late on a Friday when everybody else is going home. Uh, And the reason for Friday is because the next day is the weekend and the guys used to be at home on the weekend. And so it kind of uh, eases the letdown and and avoids the embarrassment um, that's inherent in that kind of situation. And and that's a a very good... um, good advice is to, is to be sensitive in how you're transmitting these things um, so that you're aware that the, the person has feelings and sensitivities and you don't want to make the situation worse. So sure. I was, I was in charge of the setting up uh, the workplace violence prevention program at the Transportation Security Administration in the United States. They're group after 9 11 that, that took over doing all the uh, screening at airports. Uh, so we had a workforce of within a year went from 24 people to 60,000 or something. And I, I remember we first, we spent the first year hiring 60,000 and the second year, um, laying off 20,000 because it was too much manpower. Um, And that created a lot of problems uh, because laying people off creates a lot of hostility. Uh, But I guess when I was running the workplace violence prevention program, uh, most of my work entailed the discipline process, the reaction to the discipline and how it was meted out. and I remember I was a great advocate for the, in the United States, we have equal opportunity, a process that if, if an employee feels discriminated against in some way, they can go into this process to seek um, a solution. And I was always encouraging disgruntled employees to file an EEO complaint um, which appalled the lawyers. Um, but it, from my point of view, that, that tied the individual up in, in this bureaucracy that could go on for months, uh, gave them time to cool off, uh, while at the same time making them feel that they they were fighting back in some legitimate way. Uh, and as long as they were tied up in that, then they didn't have time to start thinking about, uh, should I bring my weapon to work um, or get back against them in that way. So in threat management, you should always be looking at ways to um, direct the subject's behavior onto legitimate avenues uh, to keep them away from illegitimate avenues. When I've looked at some of the cases and and, and, um, some of the research and even cases that we've had in the UK, one of the things that struck me, and you, you, you mentioned or referred to this earlier on with, with the individual that was not focusing on his prison sentence, was that you can see that they've gone to a huge amount of effort and spent a great deal of time planning this journey, this this whole all the various stages of their attack plan. But very often what you could also see with hindsight was – they had no exit strategy. They'd never really considered what was going to happen at the end of this. Um, and you know, we've had a few cases here in the UK where some of our politicians have been attacked. And on a couple of occasions, as an example, having attacked the politician, they've just sat down and waited for the police to turn up. Um, and it, it, is that a common commonality? Am I am I have I, I kind of am I have I identified something right there, or, or or is that just a generalization? I don't know of any research that addresses that in particular. There may be, but I'm not aware of it. Um, But I've seen that happen as well. Um, It it happens, I think, more 
in cases of what we call impromptu violence. Uh, impromptu violence is very similar to intended violence. It, in terms of there's a grievance, getting the idea of being violent, but it's spur of the moment. And so there's no research and planning. There's no preparation. It's um, you, the subject gets into a situation where um, maybe it's an argument or uh, something that arouses emotion. And although they did not come to that situation with the intention of committing violence, uh, they get so riled up that um, spontaneously they take a swing at the other person or uh, we, I saw a lot of that at TSA where two employees would be in the break room. I remember one case where we had two employees in the break room and they got into an argument about what channel the television should be on. And uh, one employee hit the other with his fist. Uh, I remember asking the supervisor, what television show did this guy want to watch that, that has now cost him his job? And it was it was some financial report. Uh, so I was hoping that he had a lot of investment. <laughs> he didn't go to work that day thinking he was going to slug his colleague um, just in the heat of the moment. Uh, and so they, th those are clearly cases where they don't pause to consider the consequences of what they're doing um, and, and, and what that means. Um, but with intended violence, they just accept the consequences. The violence is worth whatever the consequence is, whether it be their own life uh, and they don't expect to survive or they they plan to commit suicide um, or they, they're they comfortable with the idea of spending the rest of their life in jail. And, and, and Chapman knew what was going to happen to him when he shot Lennon, and he accepted. In fact, he embraced that. Yeah, I mean, he sat down and read his book, didn't he? The um, that he that he brought with him. So the, the pathway is, is so the interesting. Book was, the book was Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, which was which is a obviously a you know <laughs> was a sort of a popular book amongst um, a certain group of people. Um, well, my generation had to read it in co in high school. Yeah, so I, yeah. I don't know if that turned out a no. whole generation of assassins or not. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when we look at the pathway, also we see, or I certainly see. The kind of lone actor terrorist, which is a kind of more recent um, uh, threat, particularly you know certainly you know since the sort of ISIS days and and the Islamic threat days, and certainly in the UK we've seen it with some of the extreme right wing threats, where they also follow this same pattern in terms of you know they had their grievance, whatever that might be, in terms of their religious or, or um, uh, views on racism, etc. But they do tend to follow the same pattern. So it's not we're not just talking about you know fixated people or what have you. We're talking you know right at the extreme of terrorism. These people are following the same methodology. Oh yeah, I, I think the path applies to nation states. Uh, it, it's, it's just anybody having some intention to commit a violent act. Uh, has to go through these steps, and the the reason the the steps are described broadly enough uh, that they fit that. Uh, and it's a I used it in training the workforce at TSA uh, because I thought that it was such a simple complex, a simple idea, a simple model that it's easily understood, um, and, and people kind of, in my experience. Uh, People look at it and say, yeah, well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And if that makes sense to them, then that gives them a context for evaluating information. The biggest problem, I think, one of the biggest challenges that threat management has is we can see threat management as a process of three steps. Identifying a suspect, a subject who may or may not be intending violence, but th that person has to be identified. 
once they're identified, they need to be assessed through a threat assessment where someone sits down and looks at all the evidence that they have at that moment and says, how great a risk of violence does this individual pose? And then based on that assessment, the individual, the subject has to be managed um, the most appropriately. When, when I say managed, what I mean is the threat manager has to manage the subject away from violence. Um, so you have identify, assess, manage. Weston and I, a couple of years ago, started thinking about and grappling with how do you get to identify? So often we see acts of violence, at workplace, domestic, um, public figure violence, where the it comes out with nobody knew what this was happening and oh, but he was acting kind of strange and uh, he he left a, a diary or he put a blog on the internet and people were noticing him um, what the FBI researchers called leakage, but they didn't know who to report it to. And so what we've been working on the past couple of years is, is how do you get the word out there that threat manager wants to hear about these types of behaviors, these kinds of communications. And so we developed a, a one page a broadside with a kind of generic description of the types of things that need to be reported. And then the issue is who do you report them to? Uh, unless it's a very large corporation, they tend not to have a very vibrant security offices. And what happens is inappropriate behaviors may get reported, but they get reported to somebody who doesn't know how to act on them. We call these default receivers. In schools, it tends to be the guidance counselor, um, the assistant principal for discipline, um, people who are not used to thinking about threats, um, who can't really imagine horrible outcomes. And so what we, we've been arguing for is, first of all, every organization should identify someone as the receiver, as the designated receiver of threat information, threat reports. Give that individual training, even if it's just basic training in threat management, um, and then have that individual go out into the organization, whether it's a company or a school or a small business and educate the employees that these are the, this is the criteria that we want reported. Um, and the, the, in the one page uh, broadside that we came up with, we broke it down according to the path, the steps along the path to intended violence. And so it was, it, it, we want indicators of grievance, indicators of ideation, research and planning, uh, preparations, and you educate people that this is re how to report, and this is to whom the report should go, and where the reports go needs to have uh, some training, and also needs to be aware of how to get in touch with law enforcement. And we further propose that law enforcement, every law enforcement officer at whatever level, should receive basic threat management training. Because right now in the United States, at any rate, the law enforcement is often the default receiver and the emergency response all rolled into one. Um, we gave some thought to what do you do in targets such as uh, shopping malls, shopping centers, or um, are arenas for concerts and things like that. Well, you, as they do in this country, they have posters all over the place that says, see something, say something. Uh, and so we envision a kind of public campaign along that nature. These are the things to report, and this is 
the phone number. Or the, this is where you report these kind of suspicious things too, but to at least get the word out. Because right now, people are seeing suspicious behaviors and either ignoring them because they don't want to get involved or not knowing who do I call about this? Who do, who do I talk to about this? And so if every organization had someone who was coordinating, even, even as a collateral duty, not a full-time duty, but just managing these reports and, and knowing what to do with them um, would be a whole lot farther along than we are now. And, and it, it would lessen, we hope, it would lessen the way these things seem to surprise us. I mean, it, it, tragically in the United States, almost on a daily basis, you read about a school shooting somewhere and it, it, it always seems to be surprised. Well, it's not, and it doesn't need to be. If we could just raise public awareness um, that this is what to look for and this is how to respond to it. You mentioned schools there, and that's a really good uh, a good point because I've, I've looked at those and, you know, I think, um, you know, very often you, you see, don't you, afterwards someone saying, oh, yeah, you know, I, you know, we all knew he was the wrong one or we knew we always, you know, he said this and what have you, but, but, but it's not reported. So they know something or they have some suspicion or they have some concerns or, you know, his behavior has changed or what have you, or I'm saying he, because um, I'm generalizing, but, but they don't always understand what they're seeing or know what to do about it. But you've got this model, haven't you? We had a, we had a, a shooting here in Virginia a month or two ago by a, and, and this is really tragic, um, a six-year-old first grader shot his teacher oh. with a pistol that he had taken from him, that his mother had bought legally and which he brought in from home. Yeah. And according to news reports, there were three individuals at the school who told authorities that this little boy had a pistol and that he intended to shoot his teacher. And the school didn't know how to respond. And they searched his backpack, but um, he had managed to hide the weapon. Uh, we had another case in Michigan last year where this was a high school student. Uh, he and his father bought a pistol together and practiced with it at the pistol range. And the kid brought it into school. He came to the attention of the guidance counselors um, because he was um, drawing pictures of a gun and shooting a stick figure. And they questioned him about it, but they didn't search his backpack which in the United States, the schools have authority to, to do that. They don't need a search warrant. And he went back to class and shot several of his classmates. Um, so th there has to be some kind of rudimentary training that if these individuals come to your attention, take it seriously, uh, make an assessment, how, how primitive that is, and act on it. Um, so the the process that Steve West and I are advocating is detect, report, and act. This is before you get to identify, assess, and manage. Uh, the, th the steps that have to occur before that are detecting the subject as a potential violent individual, reporting that person to, the, to someone who knows how to handle the reports, and for that individual who receives the report to then act on it. And the, the acting would be identify, assess, and manage. I think that's um, crucial. I mean, I, I know that you, know, you and I talked off, off air before this, and I, I was, you know, we were discussing this issue around so few people really understand the, the behaviours of concern, and particularly the, the pathway and that, if they're not from the world of threat management, and certainly in the UK that's, um, it, it's, still, it's probably even rarer. But all these issues are going on every day in the work environment, in the school environment, in other environments. And, you know, HR people, human resource people, um, secretaries, PAs, whatever, are receiving information, information is coming in, and they may not recognise 
or understand that this is a problem. And if they don't understand it, then they're never going to inform anyone in security. Right. And so there is this, I've always felt this disconnect between, you know, the actual threat assessors, they can be as brilliant as you, as you can be. They can be, you know, everyone can have you in their office, but if you don't know about it, you can't identify it and assess it and all those sort of things. So I think this, um, this new piece of research, which, which is a fantastic read, um, it is so crucial to fill that gap of, of how do we how do we get the I use this term not I don't mean it to be dismissively but the uneducated to recognise that there actually is a process that they can report it and then some then a professional can actually make that assessment. Yeah, and we're talking about, and I think this is a vitally important. We're not. Focusing on training the judges, the CEO, the public figure, the ones we want to reach out to are the school bus driver, uh, the people that tend the lawn around corporate headquarters, the fella that runs the snack bar. Uh, and the reason we want to reach out to those people is because they mingle with the public. They're in a great position uh, to overhear the school bus driver knows who's dating whom without the per- parents' permission. And, you know, they, they, cause these kids talk and the bus driver is just wallpaper. Uh, and so they pick up on a lot, of, a lot of things. The custodians pick up on a lot, um, and, but they're not normally the people that you think need to be trained. Uh, and yet they're the best position. They're in the hurly burly. They're down with, the people. Uh, So you want to train receptionists and anybody that answers the phone and uh, people who, who have any contact with, with the public or um, with others doing business with whatever organization you're in. Those are the people that, that see what's going on and they just frequently don't know where to take their information to. And with, with detect report act, that sets up a process uh, for getting that communication flowing and for the right people to begin getting reports that they can then use to make assessment and management decisions. And, and I, I would also add, certainly, I mean, I mean I'm very UK centric with this, but certainly security personnel, frontline security personnel. And you mentioned, you mentioned um, theatres and shopping centres and all these sort of places where you, you may well have, uh, static guards or other type of security on and you know you'll be familiar that, that we had a terrorist attack a couple of years ago on a on a r- large um music center where an american artist was um about to uh or actually was performing and we've now got this whole concept called martin's law coming in which is around um large venues etc like that having to have a a process in place but the security people who are on the front line they may be the ones that will detect the person doing the hostile reconnaissance, the same person turning up time and time again at the same venue or or moving, moving diff, different venues as if they're following a particular artist or something. And yet again, you know, we, we often look at this and we think you've had a great brief, you know, briefing before you went on duty. How good was your debriefing? Or actually, at the end of the day, do you all just kind of hurry off home and no one really worries about it? Nothing's happened, so let's just go home. Um, and actually, this detection piece is the key piece here, where it's about getting that information and saying, actually, there was this guy who was acting a bit strange and what have you. And that's the detection piece. Oh, exactly. And I, I don't know what they're doing with airport security now, but I always thought that they should have people out in the parking lot just roving around looking for uh, suspicious behavior. Years ago, I went to a security briefing given by Israeli security forces, and I remember the fellow said that the biggest challenge they had in in terms of preventing suicide bombers, the biggest challenge they had was convincing their own people that you could prevent a suicide bombing. Um, and they had ways to do it. Uh, for example, it, it, um, I remember him t- saying that at a gathering where there would be lots of people, say a politician giving a speech or something, they put people on the perimeter looking for the lone person being dropped off by car because that's how the suicide bombers 
work. They someone takes them to the venue, uh, and so they look for the lone individual, maybe dressed inappropriately, having a heavy coat and during the summer or something. Uh, but it was this whole idea that yeah, you can interrupt the plan, you can disrupt that. Um, but we need to sec- convince our own security people it's not a hopeless task, that we don't want them throwing their hands up in despair. Uh, we want them being aware and, and, and trained. And that, that's why we think law enforcement, local law enforcement, as part of their basic training, should get training in threat management and, and recognizing behaviors uh, associated with the path. I completely agree. And certainly in the UK, that would be... That would be something I would strongly reinforce because certainly, you know, I worked in various environments and it, I had no threat management training. You know, when I, when I, even when I went into parliament, I learned this material because I went off and learned it on my own because I was fascinated about it and interested about it. Um, but there was no training for it and, and there still isn't. So I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, cr- cr- critical. And I think of every, you know, every venue, every incident that police officers in the UK will go to, and how often are some of this material probably present? How often is it present? But because they're not aware of it, there's no reporting of it. There's no collation of that information. So the same is true here. It, it's a terrible missed opportunity, I think, and, and that one that is easily rectified. Uh, I, I found at TSA where we had 40,000, 50,000 employees, we did – we set up an online course that every employee had to take, and it was just um, basically explaining the path to intended violence, why it was important, and what behaviors along the path look like in, at a general level, and and who to report it to. And I never once heard that it was too complicated or too sophisticated for the workforce. Um, we never had a complaint about that because of the, if I may say so, the, the concept is so simple uh, and and obvious when you point out to somebody. Uh, the, the reaction we've always gotten is, oh, that makes sense. Uh, I can see that. Uh, and that, which is, I think, why it's such a beautiful concept um, and should be used in training. I completely agree, and and uh, as you know, I use it all the time. And I've um, you very graciously allowed me to amend it to review some risk things, but which I'm very grateful for. But um, Frederick, listen, I could probably spend the whole day talking to you about this because it's it's such a fascinating subject. But I'm conscious of the time. Um, I just wanted to just to say a huge thank you for uh, taking the time to discuss this with me, and and particularly sending me a copy of your latest research, which which I've read and shared because it's so in- interesting. Um, huge privilege thank you so much for all the work you've done over the, the decades because it's been invaluable and I'm, I'm sure you've saved your work has saved a huge amount of lives um but thank you very much indeed for being a guest on the podcast well thank you for having me i, I enjoyed it thank you for listening to the online bodyguard podcast with host philip grindel ceo and founder of diffuse Please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms.